What Putin saw was that he could take action and that the West would not really act. You could almost imagine the, the Kremlin saying, well, the West is not going to do anything. And they, and they were right when they went ahead and annexed Crimea, that even at this point, after all that they've done, the Russians are still not able to protect themselves. And it's only going to get worse for them. You can have multiple ceasefires with Russia. It won't honor them. And as soon as it's ready, rearmed, re-equipped, it will come back again for an even bigger attempt. The key to solving this situation is to make sure that Ukraine gets Crimea back. Number one, you isolate it. That means the Kerch Bridge, the land bridge, so that it becomes isolated. And then the long term, making it untenable by going after those facilities that everybody knows where they are, airfields, seaport, logistics hubs, all of those things. Uh, and then at some point, of course, there will have to be land force that goes onto the Crimean Peninsula. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. If you're new to us, Frontline is our regular YouTube series about the war in Ukraine and global security. And today we're marking the 10th anniversary of Russia's illegal invasion of Crimea. I'm delighted to be joined in London by Maxim Tucker, a journalist for The Times who was in Ukraine at the time. Maxim, welcome. Thank you for having me. And we're delighted to be joined from Germany by General Ben Hodges, a former US Commander Army Europe from 2014 to 2017. General Hodges, welcome back to Frontline. Thanks for the privilege. Maxim, just to start with you, talk to me about what it was like covering the situation in Ukraine back in 2014. I mean, you were there, you covered the Maidan protests that were hugely significant. What was that like? Yeah, you, uh, there was a feeling on the ground that this was a real moment for Ukraine, that something special was happening, that something big was going to change and that people were determined to remove the Yanukovych government and get rid of his corruption um, once and for all, having tried to get rid of him in 2004. Um, and I remember actually thinking about, you know, the depth of feeling and the passion behind this and talking to my editors at, then at The Independent and saying, there is something that's going on here that's going to be uh, possibly a revolution, could en even end up being a war with Russia. Um, and at that point, they were saying, that's unthinkable. You're, what you're saying is hysterical. It doesn't sound realist. We're not going to print that. Um, so I remember having a back and forth trying to explain how important this was to them, people not quite grasping the... the, the significance of Ukraine ge geostrategically at that point. And General, looking back now at the West's response to Russia's actions in 2014, what lessons do you think we should have learned but maybe didn't? Well, of course, it's despicable that we were so uh, flaccid in our, in our response. Uh, we, we failed to respond after 2008 when, when they invaded Georgia. And then we really didn't do much after they jumped over President Obama's uh, red line in Syria. And so you can almost imagine the, the Kremlin saying, well, the West is not going to do anything. And they, and they were right when they went ahead and annexed Crimea. In fact, the U.S. was even telling the Ukrainians, don't fight back. Let them, ha let them do what they're doing there. And uh, it, it seems so short-sighted now. And then everything that happened after 2014, this Minsk process was a joke. Uh, the Russians were never serious about anything other than gaining more and more control over Ukraine. And then, uh, and then you fast forward to uh, 22, in the months before they launched their large-scale invasion, they were certain that we would not respond. I mean, this is what failed deterrence looks like, because we had failed those other times, as I had described. The Germans were still building Nord Stream 2. The U.S. was a mess coming out of our on election January 6th and coming out of Afghanistan, I think the Russians were pretty sure we were not going to do anything meaningful. And uh, so here we are. Maxim, for Vladimir Putin, why does Crimea hold so much significance? Well, I think it's important to note it's not just for Vladimir Putin, it's for Russians as a whole, because Russia, for Russia, Crimea is uh, its warm water ports. Um, it's really important access to the Mediterranean through Crimea um, and from the times of Catherine the Great it's been an important part of Russia's military ambitions and its trading ambitions. Um, so for that to be, you know, to, to go over to Ukraine and, and then for a Ukrainian government that might be hostile to Russia was unthinkable for Putin at that time. Um, and when he saw the Euromaidan protests and the, the destination and the direction of travel of the Ukrainian government towards the West, towards Europe, I think he thought that was a risk that 
we, he couldn't take. And there were Russian bases already in Crimea, and there were Russian bases that had been leased from the Ukrainian government, which had been very close to Vladimir Putin. And when he saw that that might all disappear, he decided to take direct action. And General, from a military perspective, what have we seen Russia doing in Crimea since 2014? Well, um, of, of course, they were so arrogant and, and confident that nobody would be able to touch them. Um, the port of Sevastopol, which has been proven to be very vulnerable uh, at the time, you know, they operated out of there as if they couldn't be touched. Uh, the, the commander of the Black Sea Fleet should have been waking up every morning in a sweat uh, worrying about uh, rockets and missiles and drones hitting him as they eventually did. But uh, in the meanwhile, except for one time by the Royal Navy, nobody from the West actually went out and challenged Russia's uh, disruption of freedom of navigation. And, and, uh, and when it comes to international law and things like freedom of navigation, if you don't challenge it, then whatever the adversary is doing de facto becomes the law. And so uh, they, they use that time after 2014 to begin to uh, assert themselves, blocking Ukrainian vessels from going up into Azov Sea, for example, um, and convincing us that we should not be in there to avoid provocation. And so uh, again, we, we failed here by not responding vigorously I mean, we have U.S. Navy ships and Royal Navy ships sail through the Taiwan Straits and the South China Sea which, against China, which is a much bigger threat um, in order to uh, assert freedom of navigation. Why did we fail to do that in the Black Sea? Black sea. Maxim, does it surprise you that, that for many people in the West, there was a lack of awareness about what Russia was doing in Crimea in 2014? It didn't receive the, the howls of outrage that their full-scale invasion in 2022 did. In fact, you'd speak to people, I remember covering it at the time, and you'd speak to people who almost had forgotten about the annexation of Crimea. What, what did you make of that and what do you put that down to? I think there's a big difference in the way that the West thinks about war and that Russia thinks about war. For Russia, it's still a, a means to an end, and it's a, it's a, it's a political tool, a, a viable one. Um, and for people in the West, in democracies, it's normally a last resort. Um, so I think what Putin saw was that he could take action and that the West would not really act. And he, he knew that to some extent because, he, you know, Ru the Russians had been putting a lot of money into the West. Um, there were lots of people who sit and sat on the board of Gazprom, lots of politicians with connections with Russia. No one really wanted to disrupt international trade for the sake of an argument over Crimea. And at that point, I think as well, a lot of people bought into the argument that Crimea was full of Russians. I mean, it was full of Russians because it was full of Russian bases and their families. Um, but people didn't want to see it that way. Um, and I think another thing that the West really struggled with is its coverage of the war at that point, because a lot of the war was covered by correspondents coming from Moscow, who saw things with a really Russian-centric viewpoint. Um, and we had, for a long time, correspondents struggling with saying that these are Russian troops, not just Russian proxies. And we had a lot of people talking about civil war and, and rebellion, and a lot of people struggling to understand that part of the world. And I think after 10 years now, we have a much better idea of what is going on in that part, part of the world, and people are much better at reporting on it. But it was a real struggle at that point. If you if Russia sends in troops simply without insignia, people struggle to describe those troops as Russian because they, you know, the standards of reporting would say, well, how did you prove that as a Russian soldier? Well, I interviewed him and he spoke Russian, he had a Russian accent. That's not enough. He needs to have a Russian badge or a pass or something like things that were just in di really difficult to get hold of. And General Hodges, just give us your analysis of, of what we've been seeing in Crimea since the full scale invasion of 2022 and, and how Ukraine has been taking the fight to Russia. Well, first, I have to say, Max is exactly right on how he just characterized everything, the way the Russians uh, view war versus how we do. I mean, for us, you're at war or not at war. For the Russians, it's always at war, just somewhere different on the continuum. And they dial up, whether it's economic or, or blatant lies or having your ships ram somebody else or, or doing those kinds of things. So it, it's it's a completely different approach. And of course, they don't have to worry about or the leadership in the Kremlin doesn't have to worry about members of the Duma uh, challenging them in some hearing or a, a media putting a microphone in their face and questioning what they do. That, it's a whole different sort of mindset. Um, 
since then, since 2022, uh, the Russians have realized how vulnerable they are in Crimea. Uh, this bridge, the Kerch Bridge, how vulnerable it is, it was demonstrated with a successful attack um, in uh, a, a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago. And since then, they have done a lot of things to try and protect it from drones. Uh, they have air defense systems. Uh, obviously, it will be quite a challenge for the Ukrainians to attack it again in a meaningful, successful way. Although there's no doubt in my mind they will do it and they'll drop that bridge when the time is right. But that will be important, not only psychologically, but also you know, the, the, way that, uh, the way that they liberate Crimea will be based on making it untenable for Russian forces. It's not going to be some big amphibious operation where they land there, but instead it's going to be making it untenable for Russian Navy, Russian Air Force, Russian logistics. Uh, and, and so I think we're going to see the Ukrainians going after that. Uh, I think it's surprising to me how inept the Russians have been at protecting the facilities there in Crimea. Whenever the Ukrainians have come after it, They've, they've destroyed radar, they've destroyed air defense, they destroyed the dry dock, which was brilliant targeting because, you know, if Sevastopol is the main base for the Black Sea Fleet, without a dry dock, it's very difficult to do uh, some of the major maintenance that has to be done on ships. And so they've had to relocate um, part of the Black Sea Fleet back towards Nova Rosisk, which is, was already a full place and was not designed to be the home port for the Black Sea Fleet. So this this is really a problem for the Russians, I think, and a success for the Ukrainians. It's interesting you mentioned that you think at some point Ukraine will have success in either destroying the Kirsch Bridge or, or rendering it essentially useless. Why hasn't it happened so far? And if it is to happen, what logistically needs to be in place? Well, of course, I'm not an engineer, uh, but when you look at the size of that bridge and the, in the, um, the pilings and the uh, the foundations for the bridge. It's, it will take a huge amount of ammunition to damage or destroy enough of those that, you, that you're able to uh, do more than just damage the rail track, for example, or uh, limit the, or reduce the effectiveness and the usefulness of that bridge. So to do something that's like knocks it out for months uh, will take an enormous amount of uh, of explosive. Uh, it's not going to be a matter of a storm shadow hitting a couple of places or something like that. And so I imagine that the Ukrainians have got you know a room full of uh, engineers and uh, experts studying where are the vulnerable places, how do you achieve the effect, uh, and it will be a combination of factors. Uh, plus, within a a uh, an operation with deception and things to divert or distract. Um, you could have people involved, you could have missiles involved, you could have uh, drones involved or some sort of combination. But my point is that that is a big operation. That will take a lot of time and resources and you don't get multiple chances to do it. So I think they're, they're I would imagine that they're working on that, but at the same time, you would want to a achieve something like that at a time that it has the greatest effect on the overall operation as well. And Maxim, were that to happen, were Ukraine to have success in, in targeting and eliminating the Kirsch Bridge, how do you think Vladimir Putin would react? How big a blow would that be to the Kremlin? It would be a significant blow, um, but he suffered significant blows throughout this war and he hasn't crossed the red lines that he's also always talked about. I mean, the only response that they really have is to use either a tactical nuclear weapon or the unthinkable strategic nuclear weapon. But that would obviously bring a Western response. So I don't think he's prepared to, to go that far. He's talked about it, but even China has come to him and said, you know, if you want our tacit support in this endeavor, you're going to have to ratchet down that rhetoric. So it will be a, a big blow for him, but his options are really limited. I mean, the, the Russian army is stretched. I think Vladimir Putin's best bet and what he's hoping for is that his patience can outlast the West, that Russia is more committed to this war than the West. And we see that already being the case with the struggles in the, in the US Congress. Um, so if he can just carry on, wait out the West, then eventually the Western support to Ukraine will dry up and he can continue eating away at, 
Ukraine's landmass. Um, and that would enable to him, you know, he's got the land bridge to Crimea at the moment. That's still a supply route. It is, it's, it's a difficult supply route because it's often within range of high Mars missiles. Um, but, you know, he can continue eating away, pushing back the Ukrainians, eroding their defences, unless there's continued Western support. And Maxim, obviously you have been covering what has been happening in Crimea and Ukraine for a decade now. You've been on a Ukrainian drone base. Just talk me through that and what you learned. So it was really fascinating to go there because I spoke to the commander of this naval drone unit um, and they are developing different ranges of drones. So what we've seen the use of drones at the moment is only the first phase. And none of these guys had any experience using drones before two years ago. So they have developed an expertise capable of think sinking a third of Russia's Black Sea fleet in this time. And I think it shows the kind of the incredible asymmetry in warfare nowadays that you can have these very cheap but thousands of dollars drones which can be mass produced um, and you quite expendable if it doesn't work out then it's not the end of the world um, and they have completely changed Russia's behavior at sea so Russia is having to hide behind its defenses it's not out in the open sea because it's worried about these drones pursuing them um, and that is going to have a, a major impact I think for the future of this conflict at sea. And that's something that really from the beginning of the full-scale invasion we've seen from Ukraine they have just used drone warfare certainly at the beginning just more cleverly so Ukraine is really determined to be ahead of the game and they want to use as much technology as possible and that's particularly important to them because they, they care about their losses, they don't want to lose so many soldiers. Whereas Russia has been willing to sacrifice thousands and thousands um, of soldiers for, for very little territorial gain. So Ukraine is really building up this strategic industry now to try and find ways to mass develop these drones and to overwhelm the Russians with drones. And I think the, the beginning of this at sea, you know, starting to hit larger and larger ships and the, the techniques they're employing now show that they're getting increasingly sophisticated in their understanding how these drones can do better damage. So against the Ivanovets, we saw them attacking the stern of the ship to disable its rudder and make sure that it couldn't steer and then it was vulnerable to all the remaining drones that came in to hit it. So they've un un understood how to pilot these drones, which are quite difficult to pilot. You know, if someone's wearing goggles thousands of miles away, um, it's difficult to steer and control, but they've managed to, to develop expertise over time and find the right sweet spots to hit Russian vessels. And we've seen that with FPV drones on the front as well. They find the, exactly the right place in tanks so that the 2.5 kilograms of explosive can have a much greater impact than a, a kind of even a shell that's three times the size. So Ukraine is learning and as long as they are able to adapt their technology and they have this safe space, you know, they have covered airspace, um, which will, when they get F-16s, that will help. I think Ukraine will continue to develop this technological route. And that is something that has caused for optimism, I think, in Ukraine. General, it's been remarkable that Ukraine has had so much success at targeting Russia's Black Sea fleet over the past two years. What do you put that down to? Well, of course, there's no place to hide. Uh, I mean, every taxi driver in Kiev probably knows where every ship is in Sevastopol. They know, I mean, uh, Crimea is the size of Massachusetts. I'm trying to think of an equivalent in the UK in terms of, of size, but I mean, there's no place to hide. So uh, what they, the Ukrainians just need the ability to actually hit, to reach and hit uh, what's out there, what they know is there. And I think uh, I would attribute, frankly, the, the provision by UK of Storm Shadow uh, and the French Scout is part of the reason that they've had success. But also, remember, the Ukrainian Navy and the Russian Navy uh, literally were side by side in Sevastopol. So every Ukrainian naval officer knows every ship of the Black Sea Fleet. They knew, for example, when the Moskva, uh, the flagship that they sank, they knew that that thing had 80s technology radar that was not you know, 360. They knew exactly what the vulnerabilities were on all those vessels. And so when they attacked using different uh, tactics and weapon systems, they exploited the vulnerability of all these vessels. Uh, and so, and, and of course, they have continued to get better at their own maritime drones. I mean, all of us watched the incredible video the other day of, you know, that ship that was sunk, that was hit by three different, I mean, it was amazing that even at this point, after all that they've done, the Russians are still not able to protect themselves from uh, something like that. And it's only going to get worse for them. And is that purely a failure of military leadership by Russia that they haven't learned their lessons? No, I, I think we're in a technology arms race. 
uh, use of drones at sea is still relatively new. I mean, the U.S. and the Royal Navy are still early days, you know, learning how to, to do these things. Um, there's going to, I, I remember speaking to a, another uh, a senior naval officer of another European Navy, and he said, no, we don't, we're not going to do this. You know, I mean, they still were the mindset. You got to have ships, traditional warships, crews, all that sort of thing. And so I think the Ukrainians out of necessity are out in front on this uh, because they, they don't have the ability to go ship to ship against the Black Sea Fleet. And, and they have figured out that with drones and as they get better and better at the technology and uh, can produce more and more of them, that they can overwhelm Russian countermeasures. And you just got to get one or two of them up against a large ship and it's going to punch a big hole in it. Maxim, like any war, this is a conflict where things take on huge symbolic significance. Think about the symbolic significance of Bakhmut and of Avdivka now. The Black Sea fleet and the way that Ukraine have successfully targeted it, about a third of it now eliminated. What effect will that have on Russian morale and on Russian decision making? It's, it's very important, but it's also had a, a hugely important um, effect on Ukraine's ability to survive as a sovereign nation because Ukraine relies on its Black Sea trade routes in order to export grain. Um, and, you know, with the Ukrainian economy in tatters, that's, that's been more important now than ever. And by driving these attacks home right in, inside, you know, the, the last attack that we were talking about, the Ivanovets, was inside a lake within the Crimea. So it was, you know, behind anti-drone devices, behind netting, and they still managed to get all these drones into this small lake. Um, it shows that there's not really a safe place for the Russian fleet around Crimea. And that has forced the Russian fleet to move away from the sea lanes, which Ukraine has now opened back up to bring grain along the Black Sea coast, along the, the, the borders of its NATO allies, and out through um, the Turkey, through the, uh, the Dardanelles, the Bosphorus. Um, so that, that's really been an important success for Ukraine's economy. It's also you know, something that is going to be frustrating for Putin because he can't use that as a str to strangle Ukraine's economy in the same ways as he would have done. Um, and I think you know, that's going to keep him clutching at straws, looking at what his options are to defeat Ukraine militarily, how he can put pressure on the West, what he can do if, if Donald Trump becomes president, what are his options for retaining Crimea and the lands that he wants using other means. Were Ukraine to retake Crimea, what happens to Putin's regime? I mean, is that an existential threat to Vladimir Putin? I'm not sure it is an existential. It's really difficult to see at this stage what is an existential threat. We thought that the Wagner rebellion, that might be an existential threat to Putin. But, you know, someone who got that close to Moscow still didn't have the, you know, the gall to go all the way and, and try and take Moscow even at, at its weakest moment. So it's difficult to see where in Russia's society you know, there would be a threat to, to Putin at the moment even with a kind of major loss. And, you know, he'd use the Kremlin-run media to spin the loss of Crimea in some way. They'd talk about the West being behind it, you know, not saying it was a defeat. It, you know, there'd be certain ways that they would try and manage that. But, um, I mean, certainly it would start to undermine his credibility. But all, a lot of the voices, the kind of the hardline right-wing voices who were kind of more pro-war even than Putin, had started criticizing him ahead of the Wagner rebellion. Rebellion. A lot of them have been put down now. You know, Igor Gurkin, who is one of the loudest of those voices, is now in, in detention. And we see pictures of him having been pretty badly beaten up. So it's clear what happens when you try and criticize Putin and, and challenge his war. Um, and not many people are willing to take that step at the moment. I'm sure we're all united in our desire to see Crimea liberated. But let me just put a couple of counter arguments to you here. First of all, does Ukraine actually want Crimea back? Is it going to be such a difficult region to govern were it to be brought back under Ukrainian control that it, that it might be more hassle than it's worth? That's an argument you hear. What, what's your response? In terms of the population, mm -hmm. I mean, it, there is an argument to say that, yes, the, 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 it's now heavily populated by Russians. A lot of the Ukrainians who live there have left already. A lot of the Tatar population have also left. But there's no reason they couldn't be encouraged to go back. Um, and I think you'd, you'd expect if, if Ukraine was to retake Crimea, a lot of the Russians would leave um, and then you'd have a, a different kind of situation to manage it. It's, a, it's really difficult to predict how that would work out. It's so far down the kind of continuum of time that we're looking at, I think. But it, it's, uh, it's certainly, it's not unattainable. Ukraine had a situation where you, Crimea was an autonomous region before, so it had its own parliament, it ha you know, it had its own 
bodies that reported to Kiev, it's possible to do that again. I mean, I think now that so much blood has been spilled over it, it's, it's be, it'd be difficult and there would be some time where you'd have a military occupation of Crimea. I think that there would be a phase of that, undoubtedly. And then I suppose connected to that, there's the argument that Crimea will be Ukraine's strongest bargaining chip in any peace talks and that it needs to, even if not publicly, then privately needs to keep the option on the table of, of ceding Crimea to Russia. I think it would be very, very difficult to sell politically in Ukraine. There's been a lot of talk about taking Crimea back. You know, there is not still a mood for bargaining with Russia. I think the West really wants to, you know, some people in the West really want to see Ukraine think about what a responsible bargaining position is. It's very difficult for Ukrainians, firstly because they've had so many relatives die and be killed and, and the horrific actions of Russians in Bucha to trust anything that the Russians say but also because they've had this 10 years now of sustained war where they had ceasefire agreement after ceasefire agreement after ceasefire agreement with the Russians, where the Russians simply lied and said they would abide by it and do something, and then did completely the opposite. And then whenever they've had a ceasefire or a peace agreement, they've just used that as an opportunity to rearm and come back again. So I think Ukraine, it's, it's going to be very difficult for Zelensky to sell that to the Ukrainian population, that now we should trust a deal with Russia. I think that's the General Hodges, I know you have to leave us shortly. I just wanted to ask you one final question. You used the phrase a moment ago about liberating Crimea. And there are those who speculate that that's unrealistic for Ukraine. Do you think it's viable? And if so, why and how? Well, of, of course it's viable. Um, and I think uh, Max did a good job of laying out, you know, the, the potential of Russia using a nuclear weapon. Um, I think there is almost almost zero chance that Russia would use a nuclear weapon, uh, that even for Crimea, because there are zero positive outcomes for Russia if they use a nuclear weapon. The, their nukes are really only most effective when they don't use them because they see how we continue to deter ourselves. So if we quit worrying about that, if we if we um, fact do the risk analysis and say it's extremely unlikely that they would use a nuclear weapon, then we should be making it a point of main effort to support Ukraine uh, with what they need to make Crimea untenable. So I, I see sort of three phases to liberating Crimea, uh, assuming that we've all agreed that Ukraine has to do this and that we're going to help them do it. Number one, you isolate it. That means the Kerch Bridge, the, uh, the uh, land bridge, so that it becomes isolated. And then the long-term making it untenable by going after those facilities that everybody knows where they are, airfields, seaport, logistics hubs, all of those things. Uh, and then at some point, of course, there will have to be land force that goes onto the Crimean Peninsula. But that, that doesn't have to happen right away. What's more urgent, I think, or the priority, of course, is making it so that the Russians can't stay there. And I think that will change their strategic calculus in such a way that it will have decisive effect on how they view the war continuing. Maxim, just to pick up on what the general was saying there, I mean, there are those who say that fundamentally how and when this war ends comes down to Crimea. Do you agree? I mean, it, the war is going to end and it, we, we don't know which format it's going to end in. I'm, I mean, if we want to see a Ukrainian victory, then it is essential to Ukraine's survival as a nation that they would, would cover Crimea. Because as long as you have Crimea in Russian hands, that is a threat to Ukraine's shipping routes, it's a threat to its ports in Odessa, it's a base from which uh, Russia can continue to bombard Ukrainian cities with cruise missiles, it can fly its jets from those, those airports. So it's always going to be a threat to Ukraine if it's in Russian hands. So if we want to see a successful sovereign Ukraine, Crimea is key to that and recovering is, is key to that. If the West is prepared to accept uh, Ukraine losing some of its territory and being threatened by Russia whenever Russia decides it wants to um, take up arms again. You know, we've seen that many times in the last decade. I think this program is a good reminder of how you can have multiple ceasefires with Russia. It won't honor them. And as soon as it's ready, rearmed, re-equipped, it will come back again for an even bigger attempt. Um, so I think that is, it is the, the key to solving this situation is to make sure that Ukraine gets Crimea back. And do you agree with how the general sort of laid out the three steps to doing that? I think that makes the most sense. Yeah, you have to isolate something. It's a, it's a big target. Ukraine doesn't have the manpower just to launch a full frontal assault on it. Um, they've, they, we've seen some really interesting limited raids onto Crimea by special forces. 
operatives, which has shown the potential of, of Ukraine to mount operations against the Crimean Peninsula. I think we'll see that continue when the weather is warmer. Um, and you have some of that as efforts to isolate. You know, some of the reason Storm Shadow has been so effective in Crimea is because these special forces went and um, demolished uh, Russian electronic warfare devices, which might interfere with targeting of, of um, Russian air bases in Crimea. And so there's, there's going to be a kind of joined up thing. There's going to be some airstrikes. There's going to be some, some land-based operations. Um, but it's seeing Ukraine fully restore that part of Crimea. It's, it's very difficult. You need to see them first get through across the Dnipro into Kherson, down the Zaporizhian front, that, the area where they were trying to launch the counteroffensive uh, with not much success. And that requires a huge amount of, of rearmament, lots more ammunition, lots more manpower that Ukraine doesn't have. So some of these questions are with Zelensky to mobilize his, his society in a way that he hasn't been willing to do uh, so far. Um, and, and sustained Western support on a level that can, can allow Ukraine to mount major offensive operations. I mean, that's the difficulty, isn't it? It, it may be feasible, it may be quite viable to liberate Crimea, but it's, it's the time question. Mm -hmm. and does Ukraine have the time? I think Ukraine has the time if it's, re if it's smart about it and it's thinking forward. And if, you know, what it really needs is lots of Patriot missile systems from the US to secure its airspace, then it can start building its economy. You know, I spoke to the Minister for Strategic Industries. He wants to build weapons inside Ukraine, but they need to be secure from Russian attack before they do that. So he wants to build factories, uh, bring the next generation of warfare to Ukraine, which will solve some of its manpower problems, you know, fighting robots, AI-driven weapons on the battlefield. That's the, the kind of high-tech solution that Ukraine is looking to now. But that does require su sustained Western support in able to make your country viable and have factories and have workers who can be secure in their businesses. Well, it's a really, really difficult sell. In recent weeks, we've had a change of military leadership in Ukraine. General Zelushny is out, General Sierski is in. Do you think we'll see any difference in the strategic approach of Ukraine towards Crimea? Well, General Sierski and his, his team are all people that have already been part of Zelushny's team. He steps up, but he's you know, still the commander of the ground forces. Um, the approach may be more aggressive because Valery Zelensky was, was always saying that he wanted to maintain and preserve life as, so, as much as possible. Sisky has been accused of butchering his own troops by sending them into the Bakhmut when it was already past time to withdraw from that and may now be doing the same thing in Avdivka. So he's been criticized for that. He's been at pain to say, that's not how I perform, that's not my intention, I do care about my troops. But maybe we will see more aggressive, more exper experimental actions um, in Ukraine, and that could in include operations on Crimea. So most of the activities against Crimea so far have been carried out by GUR, Ukraine's um, intelligence directorate. Um, and I think we can expect to see more of that, more of these outstanding, like incredible raids on jet skis and fast boats coming from oil rigs halfway between the Ukrainian coast and the Crimea coast, and lots of different um, experiments with drones. You know, th th we've seen just the, the beginning of the use of naval drones. The, um, when I actually visited the naval drone base in in Ukraine, the, the military intelligence directorate showed me they had a range of new different drones. So we've seen the deployment of the kind of the Magura V5, they're called, but there are some other drones that they haven't yet used, including mine laying drones, including much bigger drones which can carry way more explosives. So I think we're the kind of asymmetric drone war versus Russia's kind of old fashioned Black Sea fleet is set to continue. Shusani Maxim, here we are 10 years on from Russia's invasion of Crimea. First of all, what are your reflections? And secondly, are you an optimist? Do you think we will see, hopefully sooner than later, Crimea liberated? Well, it's a, a, a big question. I mean, for, for the last 10 years, I've been impressed by Ukraine's ability to defend itself against such a huge military power. Um, and I've been increasingly pleased to see the West realize its role. I mean, this, some of this goes back to the Budapest Man Memorandum where you know, Ukraine agreed to give up its nuclear weapons in, in exchange for guarantees for security from the US and the UK. Um, and the UK has been living up to that so far as it can, but we, we sadly just not a military, major military power anymore that can help Ukraine by ourselves. We need the US to come on as well. And so much of that depends now on the elections of Don with, with Donald Trump posing as a, a viable opposition candidate to Joe Biden. If he comes in, you know, he's made his position on Putin clear that they're, they're in very friendly relationships. He is not prepared to go to war on behalf of Ukraine. He doesn't even want to spend money on Ukraine. So if he becomes president, I think we, it will be a very dark time for Ukraine. And it's difficult to see optimism about Crimea. 
if Biden continues, he will still need to gain some kind of Republican support in, in the Congress in order to pass these bills that he wants. So it's very tricky to see within the next kind of four years how it would work out unless the defeat of Donald Trump means that brand of republicanism, that kind of Putin-friendly brand of republicanism we see now is done for completely and a new party emerges, then that might give some opportunity op for optimism in Ukraine. But I can say from having spoken so, to so many Ukrainian troops in that area that they are incredibly determined to carry out their mission, they're incredibly determined to liberate the land, and they will not stop in that determination and, and they will not be deterred. So I think, you know, as long as the support is there, they will keep trying. Maxim, really appreciate your time. Maxim Tucker joining us here in London. And General Ben Hodges joining us live from Germany. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege, guys. Good talk to you. Thank you for watching Frontline for Times Radio. For more on global security and the war in Ukraine, you can listen to Times Radio, take out a digital subscription to The Times and click subscribe on our YouTube channel.